the Journal of Cognition did a study where they took four groups of people and they had them do one task for 50 minutes. One of the four groups took two small breaks in the course of that 50 minutes. They were the only group that maintained a consistent effort and level of excellence throughout. Uh, Wall Street Journal studied computer workers. They found that when they took small breaks, that they had 13% higher accuracy, accuracy in the work that they were doing. The brain is weary when we just keep making it go and go and go and go in this pressured way. But the solution doesn't have to be big, unrealistic stretches. You said it sounds so starry-eyed. I'm not talking about sitting for 40 minutes of starry-eyed space. I'm talking about when you take 30 seconds. I told you just before we got on the phone that I got a rough email from somebody. And it's a perfect example of, I got a rough email and my mind said, shake it off podcast time. But I took, it couldn't have even been five seconds to just stop for a minute and say, ouch, that felt bad. I felt misunderstood by that person. Now, if I, if I ingest that feeling or that moment, I process it, I move through it, I'm finished. If I don't, that little nasty email is sitting underneath every minute of our conversation because you can't make it go away. You can just push it down. So these, these little sips of space can come in so many different flavors and utilizations. It's not just rest or creativity. There's a lot of it, a lot of variations. Okay. You did. That's a perfect segue into Dr. Frank. You know, you okay. talked about oh, him yeah. in the book, right? And him. so yes. he said, he said, and he taught his residents that, I mean, this is, this is just so right for the doctors, but that he taught his residents that before you go into every patient room, you know, so that you're not carrying the quote, vapor trail from the previous patient, right? Because I'm sure yeah. this was a heavy conversation you just had with that patient. So this gentleman, this doctor would pause and you know regain himself emotionally and cognitively before he went in. So let's talk just about that. For a couple seconds. And a lot of his residents said it was the most valuable thing they learned in their entire education was just to stop outside the room and just pause. He also was a guy who docked workers who took a working lunch break. If they didn't take a designated lunch break and really go away and relax and eat and enjoy their food and come back refreshed, then he would dock their pay. And it was a little bit facetious, but it was also because he knew the difference. He really, really appreciated the strategic pause. And this is a doctor from a little small kind of farmish town who you wouldn't think was particularly insightful about novel workflows, but he had a sense that when you're in motion all the time, you're simply not present and you can't be a good doctor if you're not present. Uh, okay. So let's keep digging into this a little more because if I'm a, if, as just a person in corporate America, or if I'm a doctor, I'm still not convinced. Yes. Yes. Juliet. That sounds great but I am seeing difficult cases. I have a perception as a physician or a clinician that I have to have all of the answers. And you know, what do we, what do we say to these people who are um, you know, probably even doing unnecessary tasks? So let's kind of get them to start evaluating their day. Here's what you say. You say, show me a person who's accomplished a lot and I will show you a person who takes thinking time for granted. You can't go through the people that you esteem and find that they're just in a whirlwind of motion all day long. And this, this tends to really hold true for people that we're drawn to thoughtful people. We admire them. We admire their stamina, their creativity, their insight. We admire the fact that they can become objective about themselves by reflecting. But then somehow on our route that we give ourselves to become those people, we, we don't want to take that minute because it feels scary to not be emotion. But there are financial reasons to do it. I can walk you through some of the waste in companies. There are neurological reasons to do it. We talked about the, the default neural network of the brain cannot operate when it's on that pressed. You, know, you wouldn't redline a Porsche the way you redline your own brain. 
And, you know, there are creative opportunities. One of the things we heard about from one of the scientists that we studied in the book was there's this wonderful thing called beneficial forgetting. And beneficial forgetting means that when you step away from something, a problem that you're trying to solve and crack and how can I figure this out, you beneficially forget your previous orientation and you come back slightly fresher. So imagine a doctor, especially a doctor in functional or alternative medicine, trying to figure out what is happening with this person, unexplained symptoms. They've been to doctors for 10 years. They've tried everything. They're still in pain or uncomfortable or have a problem. We need that sense of, I would imagine that the doctor would benefit enormously from beneficial forgetting to keep coming back fresh and seeing it with new eyes. So there's so many reasons. And I think the biggest one probably is just the way that you will feel if you try it. If you try a day where you interlace a little more space, uh, I bet at the end of the day, you'll be a convert. Even if you're a type A, go-go skeptic, because it just feels different. The whole day feels different.